The late Oyugi made uh, what to me I call a technological blender. Nakuru was a little different from other districts in that the president of the country lived in that district. From the meeting, when he came to the meeting, he, he made the announcement that Dr. Uko had been found at Gotalela in Koro and he was dead. Seeing the body, chills just went down my spine. It was a horrendous sight. As the government sat down to investigate, the matter of the Foreign Affairs Minister, an affair that ran into weeks later turning into years, Anguka will soon find himself at the center of Dr. Uko's murder. I was um, scheduled to attend a provincial commissioner and district commissioners meeting with the president at State House. My driver, Sambule, came to me and told me that it was being announced over the radio that the Ohuku Commission had been disbanded at the directive of His Excellency the President. And that I, amongst others, had been arrested. But it was true. The Commission set up to investigate the murder of the Foreign Affairs Minister and one that had summoned more than 200 witnesses was abruptly dissolved. Actually, I'm the one who broke the news to Kisheru Commission. They were not aware. Because I, when I went to file my piece, the editor told me, is, is, a, is a statement from Set House? I came and told the commissioners, are you aware that you have been dissolved? He said, no, we are not aware. But the president has no power to dissolve us. A dispatch from State House had announced the arrest of John Anguka, Nicholas Biwot, the Energy Minister, and Ezekiel Yugi, the Internal Security Permanent Secretary. So I waited for the time of 2 p.m. to go to the meeting. Although it was being reported that I was arrested and I knew I wasn't, I didn't shy away to go to State House because that was the venue of the meeting. I did so believing in my heart and my conscience that I had no reason to run away or to go opposite direction. So I decided to go where the president had scheduled the meeting. John Anguka, an enforcer of the law, had now become its victim. I got to the gates of State House and I found the gate locked and all provincial commissioners and district commissioners standing outside. No sooner had I got to the gate than a crowd of paramilitary policemen, general service unit, came to me with guns cocked with orders to surrender, lie down, or be shot. What was meant to be a security meeting of top provincial administrators with the president turned out to be the longest day for John Anguka. Two unmarked cars were ahead of me, two were behind, and I was in the middle. So like a thief, I was hounded away in very, I would say, very uncivilized manner. John Anguko was not being held at a police station, but at a paramilitary base, the General Service Unit Camp in Ruaraka. I was led into a house, a room that was very dark. The floor was very cold. It was a cement floor. There was no chair, no bed, nothing. I was locked in and left without water or food for hours on end. They were asking me about the minister and how I was connected with him and uh, questions relating to his death. Most of questions I didn't answer because they were asking things that I did not know. His bosses, Zekayo Yugi, and the Energy Cabinet Minister Nicholas Biwot were temporarily held at the police stations, and at some point, they were held in the same building. 
be what was held for less than 14 days as was Ezekiel Yogi. The two were later released. When I went to CID headquarters, I stayed more or less the whole day. And uh, about five, I was officially informed that I was being charged with the murder of the minister. It was a shock. For John Anguka, it was the start of the longest journey behind bars. So at uh, six, I appeared before the chief magistrate, Babu Echeng, and was read the charges. Within a day after I appeared in court together with uh, Pravin Bauri as his two lawyers, uh, Anguka told me that some people in his family again felt that I should not represent, represent him, and that uh, um, they had been assured that Anguka would be released, uh, would not be committed for trial in the High Court. The wife, who had by now been moved to Germany as a diplomat, was recalled back to Kenya. Susan Anguka says the experience was harrowing. We didn't expect to be called home uh, so quickly or without being given time to pack. I was having all the children with me. The, my four sons were with me in Bonn. For 1,000 days and before two judges, John Anguko was subjected to a lengthy trial. Susan says when she arrived in Kenya, she was not just John Anguka's wife, but a suspect in the eyes of the government. Prepared to go and to go and see if I could meet my husband at the CID where we were told he was being held at. They drove off and we drove. They went round and so many places and we ended up into a forest. Then they would walk out of the car, you know, stroll in the, in the trees and talk away from me. I would be left with the driver in the car while they are out there and the driver would be telling me, oh, just tell them what they want to hear. Tell them, they want, they want to know. You know they can harm you, they can hurt you. Tell them what you know. I think, according to him, he wanted to know if any of my children are Mr. Uko's children. The prosecution was trying to allege that Dr. Uko had an affair with Anguka's wife, and therefore Anguka, in revenge and retaliation, uh, murdered Dr. Dr. Uko. But there was no evidence either to suggest, no concrete evidence to suggest that there was uh, such an affair or that uh, Anguka was motivated in any way. The prosecution called in several witnesses, among them Philip Rodi, a farmhand at Robert Ouko's home. It was only Philip Rodi who attempted to place John Anguka, the home of the Foreign Affairs Minister, on the night he went missing. Rodi wrote 25 statements. He went to the scene and saw the minister's body. He never said he saw anybody in the compound. Hezekiah, who we were arrested with initially and was released for lack of evidence, had mysteriously died. Rodi alleges that he saw both of us. Oyugi was dead and buried, was not able to answer. So they dragged him from his grave and lumped him together with me. And after one year, he was able to remember what he saw a year back, which he could not remember in 25 statements. So we also tried to find out how this witness could come up with this story a year later. And uh, Laka was on our side because we found out that, you know, he changed his story on the basis of uh, a job he was given in the Ministry of Labor. The prosecution was trying to build a theory that Anguka was involved in the minister's death. The former Nakuru DC says he had known Robert Ouko for a long time. Dr. Ouko was not my boss, but he was my friend. Oyugi was not my friend, but he was my boss.
Apart from Philip Rodi, the prosecution struggled to place Anguka at the scene of the murder that a judge would later rule was practically impossible for John Anguka to pull off alone. Days before the court was meant to deliver its ruling, the trial judge Justice Fida Hussein Abdallah was hosted at a school function where he uttered what many said was suicidal comments. He said that Kenya had become so bad that the innocent are incarcerated and the guilty are set free. The judge was sickly, but he had said that he wanted to finish my case before he could go for treatment, but that they prevailed upon him to go for treatment. So he went for surgery at a hostel in Nairobi. He didn't leave that uh, operation table. He died. The judge was taken ill. He died before delivering his judgment. Because of his religion, Justice Fida Hussein was buried before a post-mortem on his remains will determine what exactly killed him. After 1,000 days behind bars, John Anguka was driven to the High Court. It was judgment day. In his ruling, Justice Aganyanya said it was impossible for John Anguka to arrange and carry out the murder of a powerful minister. Justice Aganyanya released Anguka on grounds that he was not the man who arranged for Uko's murder and subsequent high-level cover-up. I had no reason to kill the minister. I had no opportunity to do it. More so, I had no resources to cover it up perpetually. Without the investigations into the murder of the country's foreign affairs minister, ground to a halt. Even after Anguka's acquittal, he says he was still a marked man. In the eyes of the international community, Anguka was the fall guy. So if there is an eye, go for it. If that eye is removed from the scene, then you are safe. So probably these people who did this heinous act removed all the eyes. And I keep telling my husband, he was not one of those eyes. He couldn't have survived to tell the story. It is unfortunate because I believe that nobody has a right to take away life. It is only God who gives life and it is only God who has a right to take it. And when we have positions of authority over others, it is only right and proper that we should exercise those uh, authorities in a way that is right and proper. But why did the police pick on a junior government officer and a friend of Robert Ouko? I was given uh, a visa to come to the US. And uh, I had to pick it at the, Uganda, uh, the embassy in Uganda. Once I got to the embassy and introduced myself, I was welcomed by the embassy official that I was asked to meet. He gave me the passport with the visa and welcomed me to the U.S. and wished me well. John Anguka was later joined by his wife and children. The long drawn out trial compounded with the country undergoing political changes somehow brought to an end investigations into the minister's killing, but it opened a new chapter. Find out who are Robert Oko's assassins next week on Case Files.